receive the word of God as we go silently to him in prayer. Once again, once again we've had some things happen in our society that have caused people to, to utter one of the most overused phrases of all time, especially lately. Our thoughts and prayers are with fill in the blank. And, and, and please don't misinterpret what I'm saying either. I've, I've used that phrase before as well. It just, it saddens me we have so many instances in our society where that phrase is, is, is necessary. We had another shooting at a Jewish temple a couple of weeks ago. And there was uh, one at a, a nightclub earlier this week. And there was even one at a yoga studio a couple of weeks ago. And I don't really want to get into the ins and outs of all these tragedies, but I do want to talk about that phrase, thoughts and prayers. I want to talk about prayer. Why do we pray? How should we pray? And what should we expect when we pray? So let's talk about prayer. And the good news is that the Bible tells us exactly what we need to know about prayer. And the other good news is that the internet is full of prayer jokes to use as sermon starters. <laughs> I've got some good ones, so here we go. <laughs> there are three preachers discussing the best position for prayer, while there's a telephone repairman working nearby. And one says, kneeling is definitely the best. No, the other one countered. He said, I get the best results standing with my hands outstretched to heaven. <coughs> You're both wrong, the third one insisted. The most effective prayer position is lying prostrate, face down on the floor. And the repairman could not contain himself any longer. He said, hey fellas, uh, the best praying I ever did was hanging upside down from the telephone pole. <laughs> Now, I got three of them, so. <laughs> and the last one's really good. This is the middle one, and this is, a, I found this, this was supposed to be a prayer that you should pray. Uh, I thought this one was pretty good. It says, this is a prayer that, that, that again, you should, you should be praying. So far today, God, I've done all right. I haven't gossiped, I haven't lost my temper, I haven't been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent. I'm really glad about that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed and then I'm probably going to be a lot more Finally, I have one more. I'd like to dedicate this one to my wife. And you will understand when I get to the punchline. But this is for you. One day, Joe, Kevin, and Frank were hike. I was going to use like Jim and Director Mike and Kevin, but I thought that wouldn't be because I couldn't pick which guy I should use in this. Uh, one day, Joe, Kevin, and Frank were hiking in a wilderness area when they came upon a large, raging, violent river, and they needed to get to the other side, but they had no idea how to do so. And so Joe prayed to God, saying, "Please, God, give me the strength." Across this river. And poof! God made him big arms and strong legs, and he was able to swim across the river in about two hours, although he almost drowned a couple of times. Now, seeing this, Frank prayed to God, saying, Please, God, give me the strength and the tools to cross this river. And poof! God made him a rowboat. He was able to row across the river in about an hour after almost capsizing the boat a couple of times. Now, Kevin, it just happens to have the same thing as me. Kevin had seen how this had worked for the others. Let me 
you be looking at me like that? <laughs> Kevin had seen others work for the other two, and so he also prayed to God, saying, Please, God, give me the strength, the tools, and the intelligence to cross this river. And poof, God turned him into a woman. <laughs> <laughs> she looked at the map, hiked upstream a couple of hundred yards, and then walked across the bridge. <laughs> So, now that I've properly uh, started the sermon, <laughs> we will continue. And now my wife is really happy, so I mean, so cool. Our great need, we have great need, and that's what drives us to pray to God. Our great God, who alone has the power to deliver us. And in the jokes, the great need was, was crossing a river, or we're not falling from a telephone pole. And as a church, we have been, we've been praying hard for others. We, we have had family and friends that are sick. We have had people in the hospital or members in need of comfort, members in need of strength, of peace, of grace. Lots of, lots of prayers, lots of needs, lots of help, lots of comfort. And there are prayers for ourselves. There are prayers for our families, there are prayers for our friends, and prayers for people that we don't even know. Prayers for our nation in these turbulent times, and, and prayers for peace, or prayers for justice, or prayers for understanding. These are all good reasons to pray. And Psalm 86 from David gives us a great example of why we pray. Psalm 86 says, Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. Now David begins with, with, uh, with inclining the Lord to hear him. Hear me, Lord. Answer me. He says, I'm afflicted. I'm needy. I need you. And the fact that he cries out to God to save him shows that David knew that he could not save himself. In, in Farther along, he mentions that the day of trouble, in the day of trouble, David was, was deeply aware. He was deeply aware of, of his great need. And that's what drove him to this earnest prayer. So we pray when we have a great need. And sometimes we pray when nothing else has worked. We might say, we've done all we can do. And the only thing that we have left to do is pray. It's, it's our last resort. And that that is okay. But of course, prayer shouldn't only be our last resort. It should also be our first resort. And the three men crossing the river, they were praying as a last resort. Sometimes, sometimes we struggle with, with overwhelming problems that are beyond our capability to handle. And God invites us to come to Him. Come as we are to receive His mercy, to receive His grace, to receive His help in our time of need. And in case, and in case you're worried that your problems are just too great, or too much, or too complicated, or that you've bugged Him once too often, God repeatedly reminds us that His loving kindness for you is never ending. It's abundant. And we cannot exhaust His love. God's abundant love, God's abundant grace and mercy, they, they, they motivate us to come to Him in our time of need. To come to Him with prayer. And whether it's great or small. If, if you ever feel like you don't deserve His blessing, 
Grace is for the undeserving. And his abund abundant uh, loving kindness is for everyone who calls upon him. So we should pray because we have great need. We pray to a God who is great in power and love and mercy. And how should we pray? Well, we should pray earnestly, like David did. We should pray continually, thankfully. And like Grace mentioned in the call to worship, we should pray with humility. And we should pray in faith. In Psalm 86, David's close relationship to God is obvious. The entire prayer. He knew God intimately. He knew God personally. And so he felt free to just pour out his heart. David's earnestness and, and intensity just oozes out during the entire prayer. And it comes from an awareness that he has of his great need. And if we are persistent in something, it stands to reason that we would also be passionate about it. Prayer was pretty important to Jesus. When, when he was perplexed, he prayed. When he was overwhelmed or pressed hard by work, he prayed. When he was in need of fellowship, he met that need in prayer. He chose, he chose his disciples and, and he received messages on his needs. If he was tempted, he prayed. If he was criticized, he prayed. If he was fatigued or tired in body or spirit, Jesus prayed. Prayer brought him power. And, and, it, and it flowed through him, unbroken and undiminished. There was no emergency, no difficulty, no necessity or no temptation that did not yield to the power of prayer for Jesus. And every time that Jesus prayed, he prayed with passion. Before he called his disciples, he spent the whole night in prayer. Passionate prayer gives us direction. In the Garden of Gethsemane, as he, as he hung on the cross, Jesus prayed with passion. In Luke it says, one of those days Jesus, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. That was before he, just, he picked his disciples. In Matthew it says, going a little farther, he felt, he fell with, this is too far away, I can't read, it's too, too small for me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And finally in Luke, it says, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Jesus prayed with passion. Being passionate with our prayers will enable us to maintain that spirit, even in the most difficult of circumstances. Prayer with heart, from the heart, is what passionate prayer is. And that's how Jesus taught us to pray, not only through his example, but specifically through his teaching. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus instructed us on prayer. We should also pray continually. David says, for unto you I cry all day long. For unto you I cry all day long. And again, his continual prayers were driven by this, this intense awareness and this great need. Paul tells us in Thessalonians to pray without ceasing. And I think the key word here is persistence. The idea is to keep coming back to prayer over and over again. Jesus talked about being persistent and not giving up on prayer. In Luke chapter 18, he says, now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray 
and not to his heart. In Luke chapter 11, verse 9, this is where we find the promise and Jesus says, Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Each of those verbs is in the present tense. Active voice. And it could be translated, translated to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Persistence. Jesus does not want us to give up on prayer. He instructs us to be persistent. We should also pray thankfully. David writes in, in Psalm 86, I will give thanks to you, the Lord, with all my heart. Right after telling us to pray without ceasing in Thessalonians, Paul says, in everything, in everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. And we should also pray humbly. Pray in humility. <coughs> David's prayer is filled with humility. He doesn't angrily demand better treatment because he's God's chosen king. Instead, he prays for God to be gracious. He refers to himself as God's servant. He admits that he's afflicted. He admits that he's needy. He admits his weakness by asking God to grant him strength. One of my biggest weaknesses is that I want everyone to think that I know how to solve problems. But David humbly acknowledges his weakness and his need for God's strength. Even so, prayer is, is, prayer is not really just asking God to give us a little boost. Instead, it's acknowledging that our need in Him is total. We depend on Him. I, uh, I read about Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War. And he, and he was talking about what he was going through in the Civil War. And he said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had absolutely no other place to go. Pray in humility. We should also pray in faith. Faith is not, not a matter of closing your eyes and and. And, and just leaping into the dark. Faith is believing in God's plan. Faith in Him <coughs> is what will see us through. Even Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. Faith rests on God's power. It rests on God's power, God's abundant love. Faith knows that if, if something is, is for our good and for God's glory, then He will do it. Pray in faith. And so why should we pray? Because we have great need. How should we pray? We should pray earnestly, passionately, and continually, and thankfully, and in humility, and in faith. Finally, I want to talk about what to expect when we pray. So often, we pray, we pray not for ourselves, but for others. And once again, scriptures are full of examples of that from Jesus. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus tells Peter, I have prayed for you, that your faith will not fail. In the next chapter in Luke, when he's on the cross, Jesus was praying for others. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And in John chapter 17, he prayed for us. He prayed for the church. When he said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Jesus was praying for others. Praying for others changes things. 
So what happens when we pray? A pessimist might look at it and say, well, there are only two options. The prayer is either answered or it's not. But we know there are many more outcomes than that. There are many more possibilities than that. <coughs> prayer isn't just as simple as yes or no. Lots of things happen when you pray. God hears your prayer, first of all. God hears your prayer. Every time you pray, God is listening. And to me, that's, that's amazing. Prayer is also has an amazing power to slow the world down. Sometimes life, oftentimes, life is moving so fast, too fast, and we need to spend some time in prayer. And that time of reflection, that time of reflection and slowing down, that will help. Part of prayer is always waiting for God. God has more than two answers for prayer. Yes, no, and, and wait. The yes and the no are easy to understand. Instead of getting frustrated when God needs us to wait, we need to understand that God is not on our schedule. And prayer forces us to wait and be on His timetable. Also, when we pray, we do grow closer to God. We grow cl closer to Jesus. Prayer is, is like a direct link to God. Talking to Him brings you closer to Him, making you more attuned to His, His, His power, His grace, and His, and His purpose for your life. <coughs> it enables us to get in touch with what God is doing and how He's doing it. Prayer opens our eyes, enabling us to see what God is doing, to see the things that that we are blinded to without prayer. Because prayer is communication. Prayer is that direct link. When we speak to God, God answers us, <coughs> speaking to us, showing us. When we pray, we also, we also help others. Praying for others, especially in their, pre in their presence, is an amazing encouragement. They will know your love. They will know your love as well as God's love. It's an encouragement and a comfort to them. But it's also an encouragement and a comfort to you. And finally, when we pray, we commune with others. When you pray, you are joining with all the Christians past and present, lifting your voices to God. That's why we pray together in church. That's why we have a prayer chain. We are building a community. We are part of a community here in this church and with other churches in the area and with other churches and Christians worldwide. We talked about this last Sunday with the uh, during communion and All Saints Day. Prayer engages God and it enables God's people, and it enlarges this kingdom. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And once we have prayed, we are ready to do anything. And until we've prayed, we can't do anything. We can do nothing. But once we have prayed, we can accomplish anything. So what does this all mean for us? My purpose today was to talk a little bit about, about prayer, why we pray, and how we pray, and what to expect when we pray. And I use, and I use scriptures to, to address these topics. But there's still so much that we don't know. So much that we don't know. And I opened by, by talking about all the, the recent problems happening on almost a daily basis in our society today. And we all share thoughts and prayers. Politicians send out thoughts and prayers, and celebrities send out thoughts and prayers. But this kind of stuff still happens. 
doesn't stop. And those people who were killed are still gone. And yet, sometimes prayers are answered. Miracles do happen. Sicknesses are healed. And you can get angry. Or you can get disappointed. Or confused because you know someone who's sick too. But they didn't get that good news. The question is, why does this happen? Bad things happen to good people. And it's hard. It happens. Some people see miracles and recover, and some don't. And I don't know why. But I do know it's not because you didn't pray hard enough, or find enough people to pray for you, or you cross the magic number of sins, or that you don't believe hard enough. But this is what I do know. This comes from Isaiah chapter 43. It says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Savior. Prayer does a lot of things. A lot of things for ourselves and for others. And maybe the prayers aren't always answered in ways that we understand or the ways that we want. But God is at work when we pray. And as we pray for ourselves <laughs> and as we pray for others, I pray that we grow closer to God. And that we grow closer to each other. And I pray that our, our burdens are lifted and our spirits are raised. And I pray and I pray that our understanding grows and our faith strengthens. And I pray that we continue to see all the wonderful results of our prayers. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Amen. And as we sing our <coughs> closing hymn, if you feel the desire to respond to the call of God and answer his invitation, feel free to come to the altar to share and receive the support of others or make a commitment by yourself in your seat. And now let us all join. Singing sweet hour.